Thank you. Tonight we have the privilege of uh, having Mitzi Perdue here as our speaker. She's going to talk about the book that she's uh, written about Frank. And uh, I'm sure there are probably plenty of questions out here that she would like to ask her once she uh, does her presentation. Thank you. Also, the book, she has books for sale. Let me, yeah, let me add that. The books are $15, and what she would like to do is to get the receiver cost back, which is $10, and then $5 to go to our club to a, a donation of our choice. Thank you, Ryan Ronnie. I want to start by saying what a joy it is to be here, because I have a nomination for one of the most agreeable things that happens in life, and that is to be surrounded by people who are doing good things you agree with. And boy, that fits the line. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, in our time together, there are a couple of approaches that I can have with you. I can tell you stories about Frank, which I probably didn't do anyway. But on top of that, I'm very into having as interactive as we can be, because my goal is to talk about things that would interest you. So if anybody just wants to start asking questions, uh, you'll have trouble getting me to stop talking. But if, if there's things that are going on with Purdue or, or memories that you have of, of Frank or anything, I'm very, very receptive to just starting off talking about that. Uh, so if anybody has any questions on their mind, right off. Uh, uh, uh -huh. yeah, I, I have an interesting story. When I was a kid, probably 10 or 12 years old, I used to go down to the uh, park and, and ball boy for my dad and Frank while they played tennis down there. Because Frank like, took an afternoon nap and then afterwards he'd get up and he'd go down. My dad worked at the post office six days a week and he got off at 2.30 or 3. Frank liked to play tennis around 2.30 or 3. I, so after school, I'd go down and be, be their ball boy and chase the ball through the river. It was kind of fun. <laughs> I love that because part of my purpose here today, tonight, is uh, a trip down memory lane because I'm going to share with some things with you that, that probably some of you have, have observed or noticed. I did see another question somewhere or comment. Well, he, he, yes. It was his driving abilities because... Oh, well, there's that. <laughs> my, dad, my dad, he lived in English Towers. My dad was Russell the Shield. They were very good friends. Oh, yes, I know. And he would, for dad's 50th, Frank bought bunch of chips. I was probably about seven years old. I was so PO'd when he took those, took those back. They were my best. But oh. Dad and I would go to take me to school in the morning. Frank had a 69 big Cadillac. He had his Wall Street Journal. There was all the way across. And Dad would go, here comes Frank. He's in rear view mirror and he'd get in slowly. Frank every now and would just go, <laughs> go right back. That's our that friend. always cracked me up. Yeah, Frank's driving. Um, you know, yeah. But, well, maybe I should leave you at that. It was entertaining. But, 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 <laughs> entertaining. <laughs> but for knowing Frank well, I can tell you that with his driving, he didn't process the idea of speed. He just, it, it, it didn't penetrate his head. Um, and the fact that he lived is a great blessing because, because the, his driving habits were, were not perfect. I, I used to think that, that Frank and I, we, we had a really wonderful marriage. I was very happy. Um, I used to think that there was almost no personal habit that he had that annoyed me. I mean, he was just, he was easygoing, he was fun to be with. What is driving? Oh, I was the exception. <laughs> and I did see a comment of, or a question over there. I don't know if there's any merit to it or not, but I'd always heard that for different events and places he had to be that he had a stand-in double. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> it was Happy Barnes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could have been Happy Barnes because Happy Barnes was very good at imitating Frank. And, and, and he did it in front of Frank, and Frank thought it was hilarious. Um, but no, to the very best of my knowledge and belief, he never had a stand in double. But, but what if, oh, I've got to go tell family members about that rumor because they'll love it. <laughs> Although I can almost guess where that came from because. I mean, he was a tremendously active person. He slept, as far as I can tell, like three or four hours a night. And so he was in so many places, you could almost guess that he had a double. But uh, but no, but I cherish that comment. Any others? Yes? Um, 
my first of many ex-wives was an employee of Purdue. <laughs> and uh, that's one thing. <laughs> well, I hope your third was a success. <laughs> because I used to tell him, you know, the, the third one, uh, you know, you have to get it right. The third, third time one. to charm, right? Eh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, three strikes, you're out. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> but when we would go to the parties, a lot of the employees, this was probably back, I'm going to say late 80s, early 90s, they were somewhat intimidated by Frank. My and little I, Frank, intimidated? And, and, and I would go to the parties, and I would just love it. We'd play ping pong, shoot pool, pitch horseshoes. And I said, look, I'm going to beat your old ass in pool tonight. He says, you know, I like when you come over because you like to hang out. Mm -hmm. What do you think the problem is? I said, Frank, everybody's scared of you. I said, you know, the, the name on my paycheck on the bottom right-hand corner is not yours. It's mine. <laughs> so I don't have any problem shooting pool with you or pitching horseshoes or playing ping pong. And he was extremely good at ping pong. He was an expert at ping pong. He could really play, really, really play. And he was a, and he was a lot of fun once he kind of like loosened up a little bit. I mean, love sports. <clears throat> We would talk about baseball, football, while we were shooting pool and everything, because basically nobody else would engage him because they were like, oh my God, he's going to ask me about my P&L. He's going to ask me about the Q&A. He's going to ask me about this or that or the other, and I'm not going to have the answer. When he really just wanted, I think for lack of better words, just quality friendship. Actually, I always felt that he was a shy man and that it was somewhat difficult for him to make friends, and possibly because... I, I considered him very down to earth and mm -hmm. and a regular guy, but on the other hand, if you're somebody and Frank signs your paycheck, it's probably hard to see through to the fact that oh, he's, yeah. he's. You know, we talked about his baseball days at SS or Salisbury State or Teachers College. I think then my father played baseball in Germany in World War II, so like you know we had something wow. you know. Oh, he would have loved that. Oh yeah, he was a pretty engaging guy. So I, you know, I you, you said that you played ping pong. Was it at our house? <clears throat> yes, in the basement. Oh. Okay, which is a transition to one of the first things I want to talk about, which is, people often ask me, how did Frank do it? You know, what, what were the personality traits that enabled him to go from a father and son operation? In 1940, when he started with the company, it was his father and him, two people. By the time of his death in 2005, he was employing 19,000 people. Uh, Purdue sells its products in 113 different countries. And how did Frank do that? And I have an opinion. I have a, I have a zillion opinions, and my opinions are buttressed by the <coughs> book that I wrote. I, I did interview 134 people asking them pretty much that question. So I'm going to ask on your behalf the question of how did Frank do it? And I'm going to answer with just one part. I mean, there are a million reasons that, that Frank was a success. But one of them had to do with those parties, and I like to tell the story because I had an involvement with it. And the story is, in 1988, we had just returned from our honeymoon. We were walking on the beach, sandals in hand, barefoot, and totally out of the blue, I look at Frank and I tell him, Frank, I think we should entertain every single person who works for the company. Well, Frank wasn't expecting that. And you know, his response was, no, that's 19,000 people. That's a totally impractical idea. And I pretended I didn't hear him. And I said, I think we should start 100 at a time. No, that's way too many. And again, pretending that I wasn't processing the word no, I told him, I think we should start next month. Oh, no, 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 that's way too soon. And, and so it went. Uh, with my next suggestion was, Frank, we should start with the secretaries because they're everywhere in the organization and they can tell people that our parties are fun and not scary. And, you know, again, Frank's saying no, no, no. But as we continued to talk, I realized what part of what the problem was because Frank was, in fact, a very shy man. To the end of his days, he was shy. And, you know, it made him uncomfortable to think of having in the end, thousands of people would be coming into his home. But as we talked about it further, I realized that I'd hit on something that was really important to Frank, because his whole career, he was always looking for ways of showing the people who worked with him how important they were to him. And it turned out that this would just fit ideally. 
and his answers, you know, over a little, a few minutes, were changing from no to maybe there's something to it to finally, I like it. And a month later, we did start. We started with the secretaries. We started with a hundred of them. And that was the first of 400 parties that we had in our home. For the next 17 years, Frank and I, three times a month, would have the Purdue associates over. And in the end, Frank, even though he was a shy man, he loved the whole, the whole thing. Because, well, in the end, one-on-one, -on -one, he was very, very good at it. At these parties, as I mentioned that we started with the secretaries, but we really did have everyone, whether it was sanitation workers, truckers, veterinarians, IT people, everybody. At these parties, he would, he would visit with each of the associates, which is Purdue Speak for Employees. He'd visit with each of the associates. And if he was talking with you, for the moment that he's talking with you, his sincere attitude was, you're the most important person in my world at this moment. And you know that makes people feel important. I was reading recently a book on, on the art of listening, and it said that listening to somebody is kind of related to saying I love you almost, because it is saying that you're important. Well, Frank was good at that. Uh, something else that, that he was very good at, at our parties, they would always be buffet. And uh, they were catered by the, uh, by the Purdue cafeteria, who I wish we had Shamir there <laughs> because her chicken is so good. Um, but, but back to the to Frank serving people at the buffet. He'd stand behind the buffet line and he'd actually serve the people who worked with him. And I can remember sort of in my mind standing aside and thinking, how many heads of Fortune 500 sized companies will actually wait on their employees? And Frank did. At the end of these parties, Frank would stand up in front of all his hundred guests and he would look at them and he'd tell them with just great sincerity, and I know that he meant it, and they had to know too, he'd tell them, I know that the company wouldn't be what it is today without each of you. And I, I learned afterwards from many of the guests, I mean there were tens of thousands of them over the years, that this, that this was really important and meaningful to them. They told me that, but I've even attended funerals where the next of kin would tell me that one of the most memorable and meaningful things in, in the jo their joint life was being entertained by Frank at his home. And, you know, as I stand back and look at all these parties, I realized that they're actually part of something bigger. And the bigger thing was a culture of appreciation, of recognition, and respect. And Frank was extremely aware of the importance of culture. He once told me, and I wrote it down in my diary, that one of the most important jobs of a leader is to establish the right culture. And for him, the culture was caring, respect, appreciation. And these parties were one way of doing it. But I think he had hundreds and hundreds of other ways. And if I could stay here till midnight, I would tell you them. But I, I intend to stop at 7.30. Uh, at these parties, the, in inculcating the, the culture of I appreciate you, it ties in with something else that I was reading recently, which is there's a famous psychologist from a hundred years ago, his name was William James, and he said, the deepest craving of the human spirit is the craving for appreciation. And that ties in with something else that I was reading recently, there was a poll by Gallup. He, he polled 80,000 American workers and discovered that only three out of 10 really enjoy their work and feel connected to it or were engaged. Well, Frank Purdue had a way around this and that was the culture of appreciation and respect and recognition and caring. The reward for him of having this attitude was loyalty the number of people who spent their entire careers with Frank was just extraordinary. And when people ask me, what was it that enabled Frank to grow his company from something so small to 19,000 people and 113 different countries, what was it? Well, one of the answers is that the loyalty meant that people would go the extra mile for him, that work hard, they were invested in the company. Uh, 
I hear a comment, and I like comments. Yeah, Would you work, share? They work 13 hours. <clears throat> Yeah, the, you or they? No, the, some of them did. Yeah, some of them did work 13 hours. Frank himself, by the way, as far as I can tell, worked uh, 18 or 20 hour days. Yes? I worked for the community about four or five years. And one of my members is uh, my time box is in the main building. I work for the veterinarians. <coughs> so I, they do do an experiment. One time we were running experiments on trucks going up and down the road in the dead of winter. My job was to run all these little probes up in these trucks loaded at the farms and they go down to the processing plant and pull the probes off the next day. So I'd come in at about 10 o'clock to the main office and I had to get the time clock. I'd knock on the door and I'd hear some noise and, and there came Mr. Purdue down a set of flight of stairs, just, just running right down the steps and I locked the door and he said, what's the matter? And I said, I need to punch the time clock, sir. I didn't, didn't realize it. And he said, well, I'm glad. You know, and I went right on through the building, punched my time clock. He'd stand there, wait, and walk up, and he's running right on back upstairs. And I'd go, now how many nights am I going to sit here? It was like three or four nights. But I said, you know, I told these were Fridays or Saturdays and when they were. And I said, this is 10 o'clock at night, you know, and I have to get here early in the morning and just knock off during the day. And do these experiments at night. The man's here 24 hours a day, almost, but keep <clears throat> that upstairs. And uh, not for any CEOs, you know, put those kinds of hours. Well, I, I once asked him why, and he said he just loved the business of business. It, it made him happy. And uh, I'm a little bit of a workaholic myself, so I have no problem with this. I was just swooning with admiration that, 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 that he worked so hard. But that's a transition to how I want to spend the next three or four minutes, which is, I thought I'd read you something from the book. And the transition is uh, what Frank was like when he wasn't working. of the book is titled Frank as a Romantic. I was impressed that Frank as a captain of industry and a tough man had a romantic side. He had always sent me two dozen red roses at Valentine's and something that really impressed, touched, moved, and delighted me he'd include with the roses some wonderful little handwritten love message always in French. I mean, is that romantic, guys? <laughs> I have a favorite. Which? <laughs> no, this is supposed to be inspirational. <laughs> I have a favorite memory about this side of Frank. He was a passionate tennis fan, which is well known to some of the people here, and would go to Wimbledon each year for the matches. One year, as we walked to the tube, on, that's the subway, on our way to where the matches were being played, we passed a store window with the most enchanting china pattern. It was gold and green and had beautiful birds painted on it. I could see it in our dining room table during the dinner party, along with maybe white linens and candles. They were so beautiful, I yearned to have them. So of course, I began hinting for all I was worth. Uh, each time we walked by them, which was maybe six times because we were there a week, I'd hint and hint and hint. Aren't those just beautiful, I'd say, tucking at his sleeve and pointing to the plates. Or another day, oh look, they're still there. Wouldn't they look beautiful in our home? Nothing seemed to register. We were leaving London on Sunday morning, and on Saturday, I knew I'd made it my business to know that the shop closed at 6 p.m. Because I kept hoping that you know, something might happen, but it didn't. That Saturday evening, I watched with a heavy hand, hard, as 6 p.m. came and went, and the store was now closed, no more chance of getting the beautiful china. A half an hour later or so, Frank suggested we go out for dinner. We got in a cab, and soon the cab pulled up at a restaurant that was just next door to the shop with the china. I felt a twinge of sadness to be so near the china that I thought was so beautiful, now with no possibility of ever getting it, the store being closed. We got out of the cab and were heading towards the restaurant, but then I stopped in my tracks. 
there was a small light inside the closed china store. I took a few steps closer and could now see through the window of the darkened store that somebody was standing inside holding high a candelabra with three lit candles. In the other hand, butler style, he was holding a tray with a champagne bottle and three glasses. At this point, Frank said, all casualness, Oh look, the story light is still open. Want to go in? As we entered the store, he was beaming. He had arranged for the store to be open and the champagne to be ready for us. The proprietor set the candelabra down and poured champagne for all of us. As we sipped champagne, Frank asked me to buy any china I liked. The china I liked turned out to be Lynn Chase Winterbirds and it cost roughly three times more than I'd ever imagined china could cost. When I saw the price, I was shocked. <laughs> Frank asked me how many place settings I'd like, and because the price was so much more than I was expecting, I thought I should be modest in my request. Four would be wonderful, I told him. Frank turned to the store manager and said, the lady said she would like 12. Please ship them to this address. <laughs> so that was Frank as a romantic. Uh, since I promised that I wasn't going to go past 7.30, I would love to autograph books for anybody who would like uh, a trip down memory lane, and you'll, you'll see names that you recognize, and you'll learn what other people say about Frank. And again, uh, I'd like my cost back, which is $10, but of the $15 price, $5 goes to whichever charity lines would like. In fact, I'd be perfectly happy if it didn't even go to a charity, if it just went in some way to further the work of this club. I mean, like, do you want advertising for new people, or, or any... It, in fact, what, what if I just decree? Can I do this? <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> now, Mark, I've bought the first two. <laughs> okay. Somebody needs to follow suit. Any of you. I'll take the second two. Hey! I'll take one. Woo okay, but, but, but the rule that I'm about to make is it doesn't go to charity. It goes to support the club in some way. So something that, that you didn't have the budget for, and it's not going to be a large amount, but it has to go to support lions in, in some way that... Uh, that you'd like to do, but you just didn't have the money there before. Pair of eyeglasses, that'll buy a pair of eyeglasses. Yeah, absolutely. I could use some extra gas money. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if the group chooses to have it go to you, everybody, you're... you're <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I've loved being with you. It's just been a, a treat and a privilege. Thank you.